NBA draft is over. A lot of dynasty rookie drafts have now commenced. Andrew from Angle here. Today, we are going to talk about uh, some of our players who we think were great winners from draft night. So landing at a great landing spot for them um, and having a good impact on their dynasty ranking. So I am joined by Braxton and Mitchell before we bring them in. Just wanted to let you guys know to check out our website, anglefantasybasketball.wordpress.com. That's where you can see our most recent uh, rookie big board posted. We have over 60 rookies posted on there. It's completely free to access. Um, you just need to go to anglefantasybasketball.wordpress.com. So let's bring the boys in, talk about some rookies. Start off with you, Braxton. How are you doing today, buddy? Good, man. Uh, today's it, It's been a good week for the Hornets. Um, just today, as of recording, they got Josh Green for a couple second rounders, and then I loved what they did in the draft, so... Um, everything basketball related is going great right now. Yeah, and you guys got four uh, four second round picks just to take Reggie Jackson. Some nice exactly. business there too. Exactly. Did you use, weren't those seconds used to get Josh Green? Um, they so they got three to get. I don't know exactly. I don't think it's been reported yet which exactly seconds um, went for Green. But you know, basically they obviously they've netted the second. Um, mm just for taking on Reggie Jackson. So those mm -hmm. things are more useful with currency anyway. They're not really assets. So so things things coming together for Braxton's team uh, seems to be the opposite for my other guest team, Mitchell. How are you doing today, buddy? <laughs> well, I mean, it's pretty depressing knowing Clay Thompson is leaving and really cementing the end of that Warriors dynasty with that big three. And even the return is a little bit saddening, too, knowing we only got two second round picks and one is a least favorable swap. So not not the best day for us. I know we signed Dan Anthony Melton, who's a pretty solid pickup. That was solid. Uh, but from a from like a nostalgic uh, standpoint, losing Clay does suck. And knowing he took less money to play for the Mavs versus the Warriors is a little bit depressing as well. But I guess his mind was set since the end of the season. Mm, I see. Yeah, interesting to see how things, I mean, obviously nothing lasts forever. We've seen it happen with plenty of teams. It's going to most likely happen to the Lakers pretty soon here, but I've already gone through this cycle twice with the Lakers too. So uh, it happens. All right, let's jump in to talk about some rookies, take a look at our website here. All right, so here we are on anglefantasybasketball.wordpress.com. Um, what you see in the middle here is our rookie big board top 30, which was made prior to the draft. So the one you want to be referencing to for your dynasty league is this top 60 plus post draft big board, which was posted today, um, July 1st. So each of us have identified two rookies from this list here where we really want to um, talk about their landing spot and how much that has inflated their dynasty value. Um, so let's start off with you, Mitch. You wanted to talk about Alex Saar today. Yeah, so... Originally, when we posted the previous big board prior to the draft, Alex Sar was pretty much mocked to go number one to the Atlanta Hawks. But uh, a lot of rumors circulated that he didn't, not rumors, but I guess it's a factual thing, that Alex Sar did, did not uh, work out with the Atlanta Hawks because something about his uh, like agency team uh, and his preferred destination was the the Washington Wizards. So... He lands in an even better spot, really further cementing Alex Sar as our number one dynasty prospect. And what you can project Alex Sar to be is someone who has the floor of a Nick Claxton, but also has the upside of maybe a Evan Mobley with a more offensive bag, but also maybe like a Jaron Jackson Jr. if his three-point shot ever uh, comes into fruition. So Alex Sar is a very exciting prospect. I know that they just signed Jonas Jonas Valanciunas, but it, he that signing shouldn't really uh, affect his playing time. Alex Sar specifically wanted to join the Washington Wizards to play that four spot instead of playing that five spot in Atlanta. So uh, don't be scared of that signing. Alex Sar is fine, and he's actually a pretty heavy favorite to win Rookie of the Year, given his uh, situation right now. So Alex Sar really cemented himself at the number one spot for us. Yeah, and that was one thing in our discussions when we were putting the rookie, uh, this big board together here, was there was a good discussion between putting Sar or Reed Shepard number one. Uh, but I think, especially if we're talking value-wise, name value and trade value-wise for dynasty managers for the upcoming season, what made us lean towards Sar is he's for sure going to play more minutes than somebody like Reed Shepard um, season one. In the long run, um, you know, I think Mitch might, and I can, I can see it too, I can agree that there is potential possibility that Reed could pass 
Alex Lazar open in the long run, but if you want somebody who's got great potential and is going to play a lot right away, um, Alex Sar is going to be your guy. What about you, Braxton? Do you like Alex Sar? Yeah, and just like Mitch said, I, you know, I, the it, you, you mentioned he didn't work out for Atlanta. Um, it seems the reports are that he didn't do that just because he didn't want to play the, the five, and it seems like what, that's what Atlanta is going to try to have him do. Um, and that JV signing really just solidifies. I feel like that's the front office just kind of telling him, "Hey, we're gonna have, we're gonna let you play the four, and we're gonna let you pretty much do whatever you want." So, um, yeah, I think he's gonna get as much usage as he can usage as he can handle in year one, especially if Kuzma's on the way out. Um, Valanciunas, I think some people think he's gonna get traded at the deadline. I, that doesn't seem like. I think maybe if he gets traded, it might be a year or two from now, um, uh, just because they want Sar to. To at least try to see, you know, have him play the four and uh, it works out great. And if it doesn't, maybe they'll have him move up to the five. But yeah, definitely like Ansar um, and definitely uh, in contention for most relevant rookie in the first season. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're going in order of where these rookies were drafted in real life, which is going to take us to our next rookie, which was Stefan Castle. So Stefan went to the San Antonio Spurs at pick four. Um, in our initial big board, and just also in in previous videos that we've done on Stefan Castle, we weren't sure if we were entirely sold on his stat set. There's not one real area of his game that he's excellent at. Um, he's just like barely good at everything uh, or just okay at everything. Um, so we were very curious, like what type of player archetype he is. It's hard to find a comparison. I've seen some people say like SGA light before, uh, but I don't really know if I see like the, the same like body style as well as like scoring spaces that they occupy. Um, however, with that being said, I think a lot of my questions around Castle revolved around where he was going to land in the draft, if he landed at a team that needed a point guard or not, because there was that whole debacle he brought up where he only wants to land somewhere that needs a point guard because he, you know, only wants to be a point guard and doesn't want to play off ball as much. So I, th I was very thrilled with the landing spot of San Antonio because they don't have their staple point guard of the future. They really only have Trey Jones, the Jeremy Sohan point guard experience uh, definitely did not go well. Um, so, you know, Trey Jones will always be there, but not, I don't really think anybody views him as like, you know, your number one op starting option. He's someone who's always going to be able to come off the bench and provide solid playmaking, but you want someone with more upside than that um, starting. Like we suspected maybe somebody like Reed Shepard teaming up with Wemby, which would have been a great fit. Um, but I do think Stefan Castle can be a great fit too. And one thing that came from today that I really like for him is also Chris Paul arriving in San Antonio. So, I mean, there was, like I mentioned, the SGA light comparison that Castle got pre-draft. CP3 was largely responsible for a lot of things in Shea Gilgis Alexander's game being unlocked during their time together in Oklahoma City. Um, even Dennis Schroeder benefited from playing alongside from Chris Paul too. So this is somebody who is going to be uh, fundamental to teaching this next generation of Spurs players that are coming in. So Stefan Castle being on a point guard needing team, uh, being coached by CP3 and Greg Popovich and having St uh, Victor Wembanyama as his teammate, great environment set up for him. Do you guys have any thoughts on Stefan? Yeah, I can uh, add when you talked about Chris Paul being a great mentor, you know, his leadership really aids the development of these young stars. You know, we can all trace all the way back to like SGA. And then even after he went to uh, the Phoenix Suns, he really unlocked Devin Booker as, you know, potentially a top 10 player in real life. Debatable. But at the time when they were in the finals, Devin Booker certainly had that uh, notion. Another thing that we want to mention is, uh, Chris Paul played for my Golden State Warriors, and he played a very pivotal role in developing Pajemski in his rookie season. So it really only takes one year for Chris Paul to really um, take an effect on these promising young prospects. And Stefan Castle, he may not play that lead point guard role from day one because of Chris Paul. I expect Chris Paul to start, but he really played that combo guard uh, role really well at UConn, and he can continue to develop his... Uh, off ball skills, but also learn from Chris Paul how to run a, you know, an NBA offense. And maybe in year two or year three, he could really take the keys and run with it. Absolutely. All right. So let's move on to our next rookie who is taken six overall. So 
This rookie was taken by the Charlotte Hornets, and let's hear about it from a Charlotte Hornets fan. Braxton, tell us about Tajan Salon. Tajan Salon is really exciting to me. It's one of the biggest upside swings in the entire lottery, I think. Um, and, and, and in a perceived uh, weaker draft, I, I really like what the Hornets did here at six. Um, I know before the draft, there was like Dalton Connect kept getting mocked there. And like, I think the Vegas odds were heavily uh, towards Connect to go at six. And I'm kind of glad it didn't, just so the Hornets could take this biggest upside swing. Um, in terms of his fit on the team, uh, if Bridges comes back, I kind of worry about his usage year one. I do think Salon is going to be in the rotation. There are some people who are convinced he's not going to be a factor at all in the first season. I don't think that's true. I, I think he will be playing. Um, JT Thor got his option declined, as well as uh, Amari, Amari Bailey doesn't look like he's coming back. Obviously, that's not the same position, right? But there's some guys headed out, um, and there wasn't a whole lot of – there's not a whole lot, at least to this point of recording, not a whole lot of guys coming in. Josh Green is coming in. But there are some vacated minutes there, especially on a team that has struggled with health the way that the Charlotte Hornets have the past year or two. Um, I, in redraft leagues, I don't think Salon's going to be very relevant, but uh, in dynasty leagues, he's definitely worth the upside swing earlier uh, in the middle of the lottery and maybe even a little bit earlier if you're that high on him. Um, he's got a nice three-point shot, and you know the rest of his games is is – it's kind of up in the air exactly what he's going to do. He's just one of those raw, like tall, lanky guys who um, people will project can do anything and everything. Um, and it'll be interesting to see which way his game or which way his game or which, excuse me, which direction his game heads um, as he develops into more of an NBA player. Right. When I saw Salon get taken at six, at first I was like, no, like I wanted, I thought, um, Charlotte was going to maybe even take Klingon and run the, the two center rotation with Klingon yeah. and Mark Williams. Uh, but the more I think about the salon selection, I don't hate it just because, I mean, obviously you guys do have LaMelo ball. He's your, your franchise cornerstone. And there's some other great play, you know, Brandon Miller is an excellent player too. Uh, so there is some, some proven young products that are already on the Hornets. And then they kind of just went in the mindset of this draft of instead of taking um you know, going for like going for the more upside swing or someone who could potentially have the highest ceiling of, um, the, you know, the top of this draft board here, maybe not higher than like Topic or Reed Shepard, but definitely up there amongst the three. I mean, to, guys like Topic and Reed Shepard is more for us in fantasy. So in real life, Salon definitely has the highest potential or ceiling in this draft class. I, you know, you could fairly say. Um, so the more I think about it for the Hornets, I don't hate it, especially if they let Bridges go. Um, you know, that opens up the more minutes for Salon. All right. And can so I just add real quick before we move on? Sorry, sorry, ahead. Andrew. Um, no I, I want to add just on the on the note of there being minutes available for him. Um, uh, Bertans and Pokashevsky both played, you know, critical roles for the Hornets down the stretch. Um, Bertans is probably going to get waived with Josh Green coming in. He's going to get absorbed in that money. And then Pokashevsky's on a uh, on a non guaranteed contract. So if you're you know worried about where are these minutes going to come from? I mean, you know, there's the minutes right there. Greg Williams isn't going to play 30 plus minutes. Most likely he's probably going to be in that 24, 26 range. So I think there is a role for salon, even in year one. Thank you. Very, Sorry. Very good. No, no problem. All right. So bringing us on to uh, the biggest trade of draft night, number eight, which was supposed to go to the Spurs. Um, I actually mocked this player going to the Spurs in our mock draft video a few weeks back. Um, instead, a trade for basically somebody in elementary school right now um, allowed the Minnesota Timberwolves to swoop in and take Rob Dillingham. So tell us how you feel about that fit, Mitch. Yeah, I mean, even going before the fit, that trade is just very perplexing to me just because by the time they get that pick, Anthony Edwards is, I don't think he's going to be even 30 yet. I think I read a report he's going to be 29 um, so preying on the Timberwolves downfall to really sell someone like Dillingham, a top 10 prospect is really bewildering to me. Um, but in terms of Rob's fit on the Timberwolves, you know, I think he's a great fit. You know, we mentioned in previous videos that some late first round guys or early second round guys like AJ Mitchell or Tyler Cole could benefit, um, replacing Conley in the next two years, but they got, a legit five-star prospect, in my opinion, in Rob Dillingham. You know, you watch his highlights, he's flashy, he's very creative, he's quick, and he's athletic. 
you know, you would really think that, oh, this guy's like the next Bones Highland or Jamal Crawford. But when you look deeper into the stat set, he's actually very efficient for someone his size and for his ability to create very tough shots in space. So that's something or that's a, another reason why we're also very high on Rob Dillingham is that besides rebounds and blocks and turnovers for a guard, he doesn't kill you in those percentages. And he shot a pretty decent volume as well from the three point line at Kentucky and uh, moving forward in like two years or so, Mike Conley is probably going to be on his way out and he's already declining in my opinion. So if the Timberwolves develop Rob Dillingham as their future point guard, I don't see why he can't be a potential top 50 staple like a Darius Garland. Um, so yeah, Rob Dillingham is certainly great, but I'm also wondering what you guys think. Is this, is this, is this efficiency that Rob Dillingham displayed uh, sustainable in the NBA, you know, with a prolonged season, or was it kind of just like a flash in the pan due to low sample size in the college uh, season? So I'll go first on this one. For for Dillingham, I think that um, you know, both honestly, both of these Kentucky guards, I think that their their efficient shooting can can be sustainable, especially because these guys were operating within a specific system, and that's what's going to happen for both of them, respectively, at Houston for um Shepard and in Minnesota for Dillingham. Um also um Dillingham has a lot of big bodies on this Minnesota roster to to bail him out of any uh, specific defensive shortcomings, as well as unlock a lot of different pick and roll partners for him. He's got Gobert for pick and roll, Cat for pick and pop. Um, there's actions he can do with Anthony Edwards. Even guys like Nikhil Alexander can get involved with Rob Dillingham too. Um, so there's just a lot of ways that he can benefit. Also, I personally, and there is studies to show this, really like when high-level rookies like this go to an organization that has a winning record currently and is currently fighting for a playoff spot. They tend to develop better winning habits as opposed to playing for a team who's only going to win you know, 12 or so games. There can sometimes be some bad habits that come into somebody's game um, from playing heavy minutes in a bad environment like that. So I like you know, it seems like more of a cushiony landing spot or cushiony landing for uh, Dillingham going to a winning roster like Minnesota. All right, so there's only a couple of rosters or a couple of teams at the top of the draft that really did not have a true five man on their team. One of those teams was the Memphis Grizzlies who picked up Zach Eady at pick nine. Uh, Braxton, how do you feel about that fit, Eady going to Memphis? I mean, you said it. This is probably best case scenario for Zach Eady and really any center um, in the draft. You know, he has the opportunity to be their starting starting center from day one. Um, and in my opinion, he has top 100 upside in this next season. Uh, I think there's a world where Eady finishes with the highest nine cat rank out of any of the rookies this coming season, just because of the stats that he provides, the you know the high efficiency big man stats, um, and then. Uh, you know, if a big man has decent free throw percentage, that's just a recipe for um, high nine cat ranking. Um, so I'll, I'll make a prediction. I'll say he'll, he'll average twelve points, seven and a half boards, and then like one point six or one point seven blocks in twenty three to twenty four minutes per game. Um, I know that we have him eight on our uh, big board there. I think there's an argument to have him all the way up as number four or even number five ahead of playing it, um, just because of the landing spot and. Uh, it, I mean, some people obviously. You, I I just I I love. Some people like to, they prefer like the talent with Klingon, um, between those two. But you know he's just blocked, and uh, in, ter- in the next year or two, I think Edie is going to be just so much more impactful on fantasy teams. Um, and Klingon screams to me like one of those guys that, you know, is getting drafted highly right now, but he might have a down year this year playing behind Aiden because uh, it seems like a trade is unlikely at this point. Um, and his trade value next year might be lower than Aiden's. So, um, and then uh, based on my prediction, um, that's about where Subots was this past season. He finished at 100 exactly um, with, he had like 12 points, nine boards, and like 1.2 blocks on, on uh, 70, 72 or 73 or so percent um, from the line. And uh, I, I think it's realistic that Edie gets there. I will say uh, Brandon Clark isn't really somebody that's going to be able to play next to Edie. So um, in smaller lineups, we'll likely see them shift, shift Jaron Jackson up to the five and have Clark come in at the four. 
Um, but then when, you know, he does share the floor with Jaron Jackson, it'll be like, it seems like they're going for like a little twin tower situation. So I think it's just really exciting from both a real basketball perspective and a fantasy perspective. Mitch, I know you like ED too. Did you, uh, were you excited about that landing spot? Anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I'm kind of regretting trading Brax pick 11, uh, knowing that Zach ED landed there today. Um, but yeah, I mean, Brax hit it all the points that I wanted to touch. Ideal landing spot, you know, per game monster. And if you look at Vegas sides, he's right in the top three for rookie of the year. And I definitely see that. Um, you know, Edie's just the monster. So good for you, Brax. Um, I hope Thank he pans you. out well. And I am a big Zach Edie fan. And on, and just to reiterate on those odds, I don't think those odds are saying that necessarily he's the best rookie, right? He's not going to be the best player coming out of this class, but did, he just has so much more opportunity than mm -hmm. a lot of these guys in the lottery um, that, you know, he may just put up so much counting, so many counting stats that it'll be impossible not to give it to him. So. Very good. All right. So that takes us on to our last player we're going to talk about today. Um, drafted with the last pick of the lottery. So pick 14 was Carlton or Bub Carrington going to the Washington Wizards. So um, I talked about a different point guard in this draft class on uh, Noah Rubin's podcast. And in a lot of those studying that I was doing for that, uh, looking at different draft combine measurement numbers, uh, as well as watching di uh, different game film and stuff, Bob Carrington was someone I did not know a lot about prior to this draft, but during that process, I realized, holy crap, this guy is for sure going to be a lottery pick. And that ended up happening. We had him way too low on our pre-draft big board coming into uh, coming into the actual draft, but it's not really something that, uh, you know, that was a for sure thing because there was a lot of mock drafts that had him in the 20s range, uh, but it was cool to see a team in the lottery take a chance on Bob Carrington, who I think um is is draft night's biggest winner he does have a high ceiling and i think a lot of teams didn't really realize that um and he's going to a landing spot where um, a lot of people don't really realize Tyus jones is no longer on the washington wizards so he's really only going to de deal with jordan pool here denny avdia is now gone um so it's jordan pool and cal kuzma who can potentially be on his way out as like main um offensive hubs on the washington wizards right now so for a point guard like bub carrington um, this is the perfect ideal landing spot. He had great um, physical measurements, a lot bigger than majority of the point guards that are in this draft class. Um, great athleticism. He's an excellent scorer, um, excellent mid-range scorer, excellent at the rim. And really all we need to see from him is more development in his three-point shot. So um, this is somebody who's going to have a lot of freedom to operate on the Wizards. Um, you know, they're they're probably just going to be playing for a shot at Cooper Flag uh, for the upcoming uh next draft class in 2025. So this is somebody who I think is gonna get a lot of run year one. He might not translate to great nine cat numbers, but I think he is a very awesome dynasty investment. Someone who you can potentially see take big scoring jumps if he figures things out in his game. He has the the the, the size to be a solid lead guard. So and the Wizards might've sneakily pulled off finding their point guard of the future, grabbing Bub Carrington at the end of the lottery here. Uh, Braxton, I know that we had some discussions about a dynasty rookie draft pick that you were making today, um, and you were feeling a lot of pull towards Bub Carrington. So, you know, in your in your time debating that today, was there anything you learned about Bub that you liked about him? I mean, it's again, it's just it's the landing spot. There's so much room for um, you know playing time in year one. Uh, they, it's very possible they just let him go out as the point guard in the night one as a 19 year old, which is you know crazy. Uh, and uh, it, it seems like his comp is like a CJ McCollum type where it's score first, kind of a secondary ball handler. He's not necessarily a good assist turnover ratio type guy, but he's got the the potential to be, you know, 20 point, 20 point per night score. Um, I got a handful of assists and uh, on, on a Washington, Washington team that seems, you know, now five years out from any kind of playoff contention, he can definitely be a piece for them moving forward. Absolutely. Great landing spot for him. Great landing spot for all six of the rookies that we discussed today. So again, if you want to see our rookie rankings, which goes all the way down to 68 to help you out with your upcoming dynasty draft, whether if you're in a 12-team league to a 30-team league, 
we got you covered. So make sure to check that out on anglefantasybasketball.wordpress.com. You'll see all of our content there. Uh, follow the YouTube channel, Angle Fantasy Basketball. Uh, like this video. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. Follow us on Twitter at Angle Fantasy BB. And we'll see you guys next time. Bye.